is a singer, a parent, someone who speaks her mind. Enter at your own risk. Ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful Jambi Joyce. You've worked in a variety of music genres, from Grand Wazoo uh, to bands that incorporate yes. DJs. How do you prepare for the different shows? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so Grand Wazoo, as you know, it's fly by the city of pants, right? It's just let's go, you know. So <laughs> um, my own big bands, that's quite obviously stressful because First of all, I love to work with um, with young musicians because I learn so much from them. Um, I learn so much from them and I love what they bring to the table. Um, I love that they're not scared or set in their ways. Um, so I just bring them all on. And because I like to be able to have from an electronic feel to a real traditional band mm. type of, you know what I mean? I like to change things up a lot. So that takes up a lot of, um, it's a lot of planning for that one. Um, and because I, they're like my children, okay? M my band, they're literally like my babies. And I mean literally because most of them are young enough to be my kids. Mm. So there's a lot of, you know, care. I care for them a lot. So that probably takes, I'd say a bit like Paula, the energy that it takes to care for people is almost sometimes bigger than organising yeah. the actual shows, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, but I love that. And then the DJ band thing, to be honest with you, the DJ band thing is a lot of front, you know. It's a lot of front. It, you you just, your personality has got to be bigger, you know, larger than life. So that's kind of how I prepare for, you know, my own band, I'm like head down, on the day of the gig, I'm a bit head down and, you know, I keep to myself a little bit. The DJ bands, I'm like, she's here, move out of the way, right? <laughs> so that's my thing. <laughs> and then Grandma Zoo's like, okay, I think I'm ready. Right, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> I thought you were well. That's how I prepare for them. Well, I thought I thought you were well rehearsed with Grand Wazoo because uh, you know you seem to just rock on and do your show and and it's, well, it's flawless. Been years, though. Yeah. How I many? Mean, how many? Know, how many? See, so Grand Wazoo. I tell you how I got into Grand Wazoo. Mm -hmm. I was working in a shop on Ackland Street in Wiley, just a store <laughs> upstairs. It is. <laughs> And Wiley comes in, never seen Wiley before. He comes in all loud and he's like, hey, I'm looking. There was another girl who used to work there. Where is she? I said, oh, she's not here today. It's just me. And he said, okay, well, tell her that um, I'm doing my show and I need a singer or something or the other. And when I heard that, just to be smart ass, I literally went, well, I'm a singer. If the singer, if you want a singer, I can sing for you. Because by now, banter, you know what Wiley's like. And um, he <laughs> said, oh, you sing. I said, I do. And he said, actually, maybe not for my show, but I sing in another band. Do you, why don't you come? And at that time, they were playing at the SB in the Gershwin room. And he said, it was like, say, Thursday. He said, on Sunday, we play in at the SB. Never know, I didn't know the SB. I didn't know anything mm. about it. Why don't you come down and check it out? So I walked in on Sunday and I saw this freaking massive band. Mm. And I was like, this is what this man is telling me that he wants me to sing in? I don't think so. <laughs> And then he saw me and then break time came and he said, come on out back. Let me introduce you to everybody. So I went out back and I remember, <laughs> I remember as I was walking in, I walked past John and John stopped and he said, oh, I hope you can sing. I hope you, do you <laughs> sing? And I was like, yeah, yeah, uh, mm, I, uh, yeah. And he said, okay, Paula, talk to her. And he went. But then... I wasn't going in there to go and sing with them. I was just going in there to check them out. Paula comes in. She says, all right, darling, so what we're going to do, we're going to audition you, but we're going to do it on the go. So next Sunday, why don't you come prepare four songs or whatever, three songs, it's three songs, you know, Aretha Franklin, right? 
And I was like, holy shit, I didn't really know too much. I wasn't, you know, I was still learning music. Mm. So it was like soul music. Okay, Aretha Franklin. Okay, right. And then on the Tuesday, madly learning Aretha Franklin songs I've never heard before. Then on the Tuesday, Paula calls me and she says, okay, so our other singer, she can't do the gig, so you're going to have to learn more songs. Mm. So I was like, holy crap. So then I went from learning three songs to God knows how many songs. (laughs) And then the day came, I was shitting my pants. Oh, my God. And I went on stage and I remember the first song was Son of a Preacher Man. I'm not a big fan of the song. But no, it wasn't wasn't that one. It was Say a Little Prayer. And, you know, with Wazoo, it's go. We don't stop for nobody. We go from beginning to end. So we started the song and we're singing and, you know, it's a bit of an all over the shop song and I missed a part and then I got lost and then I was like, whoa, fuck. <laughs> you know, I was like, and because nobody else sung the song, nobody could help me. So I was like, shit. So we got to the end and then sang all the rest of my songs well, got to the back and Paula said, well done, darling. We'll see you again next week. And I was like, what? <laughs> really? Okay. And the rest, as they say, is literally history. Like the, my daughter was one when I met Paula and she's 13 wow. and a half now. So, wow. you know, I think there's maybe a space of two years that maybe I didn't sing with them but I've sung with Wazoo pretty much the whole time. Yeah, right. Yeah, so. <laughs> so you'll... you'll, you'll uh, Wiley. <laughs> Wiley brought you in. He got me in. It was good though. Yeah, he's a top guy. And he, I love Wiley. And, and his son's doing really well in the uh, AFL. Yes. I think it's, it's, it's... Interestingly enough, my brothers... So I've got brothers the same age, age as him. They know him. So just... Maybe a couple of months ago, I said the name Tuki. And they were like, you know Tuki? I was like, yeah, that's Wiley's son. <laughs> we know Tuki, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, we sung together for so many years. They know all about the band, but we've just never put two and two together. Yeah. Okay. So it's really good to see that. Oh, yeah, totally. Have you been working full time at all, like, during this period of time? Well, when, oh, so basically for me, it all stopped on the 13th. So I did, I was doing the Grand Prix. So I was booked out for the Grand Prix. I did a gig on the 12th for Ladies' Day. Um, And I thought something was a bit odd because it was supposed to be like hundreds of women, influential women, but there was only about 100. And I remember on that day thinking, this is a Mercedes event. This is gonna. This is a bit weird. And then the next day, it was all shut down. Um, I fortunately found a uh, full time job within you know a week or two, um, working for Coles Online. So just doing call centre work. So I was working from home. Um, it was. Oh my god! It was interesting. It was. It was. It was really, um, yeah, it was really interesting. So I did that full time for, uh, it was a three month contract, but I only did it for for like a month full time. And then the hours started cutting down and cutting down. So um, I just, I got onto the niece program because, you know, I, you know, I like to hustle on the side. So I did, I entered the, the training just to write a business plan for my um, uh, the African side business that I, that I've got. So whilst I decided what to do, because I you know I didn't really know what to do. There's no work, um, and then I so I've got my business plan, and then I enrolled in a the um, the training and assessment um, uh, set four and five. So that's what I've been doing, you know. So not working, but it, it's like I'm working. I'm I'm yeah. just kind of getting myself sorted for when we get back, you know, when we get back on board. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Who knows when, when that will be, you know. Well, that's why you just have to keep the ball rolling. I that's mean, it. you know, as you know, 
having having a 13 year old means I don't have the luxury unfortunately to to sit and and wait or argue or cry you know what I mean like I just I have to whilst I'm crying and carrying on I have to be doing something yeah so it for me it's actually a really good it's actually been a really good thing because that keeps me it keeps me centered just when I'm starting to veer off the left or the right I you know I've got this 13 year old who comes out and just centers me and then I'm like okay Right. Okay. Right. Okay. This is actually what's important, not that other stuff. Yeah. You know. So I'm lucky in that way. So she's like your Tai Chi master. Totally. She she's like, and she's got like a game face, like you wouldn't believe. So she keeps me on my toes. And oh, that's good. So you you, you, <laughs> you sung. You, my toes. So you sung with Jennifer. You sung at Jennifer Hawkins's um, wedding. What was that like? Ah. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that was really interesting. It was just a, um, I got the gig uh, because, you know, I'd, I'd been singing for Maya in the birdcage um, at the races. I, you know, it was my first year kind of, you know, doing something big like that. And, um, you know, I didn't really know who she was. And she walked up to me and she said, um, I'm getting married and I want you to sing at my wedding. I was like, mm, okay. Why not? So I spoke to my manager and they organised it. I didn't really know, you know. I was, I don't know who she is. I don't follow that world. So I didn't know who she was apart from a model. I knew she was a model, but I didn't know anything else about her. Um, And so the wedding was in Bali. I'd never been to Bali. So I was like, it's like everything I haven't done all in one. (laughs) So, um, you know, we organised everything and... um, we weren't given a great deal of information, I guess, but I didn't really care. I was getting a holiday and I was doing something new. And so I went to the airport for that 9 a.m. flight that you get to go to Denpasa and I got to customs and they said, you can't go through, you don't have a visa because I still carry my Kenyan passport. So I couldn't go. So I got back in a taxi and I called my management and I just went... Um, I'm on my way back home and that's just all it is. And it was like, oh my God, freak out. So I went to the consulate, the um, Indonesian um, embassy. I was told to speak to some guy, leave my passport. And within like 24 hours, I got my passport back with a visa. And it was when it used to take like days and days. It used to take, I don't even know how long to get your visa, your visa and your passport. Mm. So that was on a... Monday or Sunday night or something like that, um, Monday. And so I left Melbourne on Tuesday kind of thing or Wednesday. The wedding was on a Thursday. I flew there. I was kind of grabbed from the plane and thrown into a car and driven and there was people following. It was I was pretty, it was pretty intense. There was, I don't know like how anybody would know that I was there to sing for this wedding, but you know, anyway, so we get to this massive, like beautiful um, resort and there's just people everywhere. And so we let through, security's crazy. And then I, I realised that the whole place had been booked out, obviously. Um, and then it was, I can't remember what the place is called, but it was this place and it was surrounded by ma- like... Um, valleys like those you know hills with just plants and trees and so you literally could not get through but I remember I remember getting dressed in one of the rooms and looking up and seeing people climbing through these bushes trying to get photos and I was like what in the world but they were getting and then you'd find security would would go and grab them down and then there was I think there was a situation where so they'd actually they paid all this money to have um a no fly zone so you know no uh, which i was learning about these things at the time and then suddenly there was this this helicopter just going around and looking and trying and there was people hanging off it trying to take photos 
It's like, what in the world is going on? So it turned out that, you know, so basically they decided, you know what, if we have to pay $50,000 as a fine, it's worth the photos that we're going to get. So it was literally just a day of running, hiding, <laughs> you know what I mean? But the wedding was so much fun, um, really relaxed. Um, my favourite part was they had this, like it was, you know, massive marquee and it was like a, a linoleum floor and they were doing slides, they were doing run-ups and just sliding, you know. They were like kids, you know. So it was because nobody could get in there, they would be, everybody was really comfortable and just chilled and, you know what I mean, like it, it, was, it was actually, it turned out to be really nice. They have a beautiful family, you know, everyone was lovely. So, um, you know, it, it, it's always one that sticks out to me. And did you, <laughs> did you take a band with you or did you? No. So I took, it was, so I just started doing the DJ bands at that, at that time. So usually I would have my DJ band, which would be my DJ, myself, you know, might have percussionist or, you know, whatever other additions that we had. But they wanted it very small, very low key. So it was just me and a DJ. So, you know, yeah, it was just me and a DJ. And so we did. Um, I've never sung for so long in my life. Like, and you know, I'd fl been flying as well. So I was I was so exhausted by the end of it. I've never sung so much. Like, it was just hours and hours of singing but then afterwards you kind of you went home and it was like holiday <laughs> never been to Bali it was the best time <laughs> it was so good yeah. so, so you stayed on did you in Bali for a couple of days yeah we stayed on I think at the time if I remember correctly we ended up getting a um we ended up getting a, a another gig at some club um at um at cocoon on a beach and um so you know we're like okay we'll go so me and and um the girl who was um playing for me we you know we got like you know tables you know when they're like yeah we're popping bottles and with this we were like oh okay we're popping bottles <laughs> it was just it was surreal it was surreal um to be somewhere I've never been before yeah, yeah. doing what I love to do and it's not even work. It's supposed to be work. Um, so we stayed there. So we did that gig. I think I stayed for about a week. Um, they'd paid, um, you know, Jen had paid um, for us to stay Great. for, you know, a few days. So we just added a little bit of extra cash yeah. and we stayed there. You know, I stayed for a week and then we came back. Beautiful. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Every singer should have some of those um, gigs in their time, I think, you know. I think, you know what, we put a lot into what we do that I think having those, there's nothing better than that moment. There's that aha moment where you're somewhere and you literally catch yourself and go, wow, oh, my God, I'm actually here. So, and that's what, you know, like that makes it, it makes it a lot more memorable, you know. Yeah. It so, makes it so, a lot you, more memorable. so, so the wedding was in Dempensar, was it, or Uluwatu? Okay. Yeah, it was in Uluwatu. So it was just—I just remember—it was just the longest drive in my life. It, I just, it was just the longest day of my life to this day. Um, so it was in Uluwatu. So we had to, you know, fly Melbourne Dempensar, then drive from Dempensar to Uluwatu. Um, which was, it was a massive drive. Mm. Um, and then I just, re I remember they were like, what do you need? What do you need, Miss Joyce? What do you need? And I was like, I just need some lemons and some honey. That's it. <laughs> just leave me alone. Give me lemons. Give me honey and water. <laughs> Lots of water. But they didn't have lemons. No? No, no. They were like, we don't have lemons. Mm. Like, Nobody, we, we import lemons. We don't have lemons. So they had this other citrusy thing. But, yeah, so it was just like, honey, 
steam, steam, honey, honey, steam, steam, water, anything, you know. So, but yeah, but Uluwash is gorgeous. Though. Yeah, I'm a, um, Indonesia is fantastic. I've been there oh. numerous times over the years, and uh, the last time I went there, I went on a uh, yoga retreat, um, oh. which, which I did for. 14 days in an intensive 14 days yeah. of yoga of yoga yeah so it was um you'd start at six o'clock in the morning and you'd do okay. three hours of yoga and then you'd have breakfast and then you'd do another two hours of yoga and then you'd have and then you'd have lunch and then you'd have whatever you want you can you can get a five hour massage because i was living in this uh it was like a matrix we were living in this right. matrix and um, it was quite amazing. It was a, and then they would you would do daily things. You'd go on bike rides to the rice fields, and you know you'd go and buy beautiful furniture from this uh, furniture shop, and you just do all that sort of stuff, you know. Isn't it nice? And you're like, oh yeah, I'll buy one of those, and I'll buy one of those. But the <laughs> yoga retreats, I'm always fascinated by them, Pete, because yeah. I can't sit still for like yeah. twenty minutes. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, so for me, well, you you choked me at three hours of yoga. I'd be, oh, <laughs> well, that that would sort you out. You, you'd uh, you'd be very zen after that. That's for no, sure. No, you know what I want to go and do? I want to go to Thailand or uh, or Bali. It doesn't matter. I've got more friends who do it in Bali, and I want to go and do a fitness camp. See, I'm I'm not a zenner. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm a little aggressive in. I like really. You, you know. want, yeah. You need to. You need the. You need the. Uh, you need the. You know the hot cabana. You know the sort of. Uh, you need. You yeah. need something to fire up. You know. Absolutely. So I'm more that way. So yeah. I'm always like, I'd love to go and do it, whether it's ten days or whatever they do of that kind of thing, where you get up in the morning at six, mm. where you start at six, and you do you know all these weird exercises and whatever and then go for bike rides that's what i'd like to do yeah. so that's on next on my plan endurance you need a lot of endurance for that sort of thing but i've got endurance you have you have i've got a lot of endurance <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you grew up in kenya what was your upbringing like and uh, how did you start in the music business um so yes i was born in kenya in nairobi and uh, so, I mean, I always loved music and just, um, you know, I always loved music. But interestingly enough, you know, I come from a Christian, back, you know, like missionary family. So I knew gospel music, I knew church music. But I reckon I knew, so I was thinking about it last week because I had to do another, uh, another little podcast. And I thought about it and I was like, actually... When I came to Australia age 10, I probably knew six or ten uh, pop songs, you know. Kenny Rogers, Africans love country music, love music, country music, mm, <laughs> we just love it. And so it was like Kenny Rogers, Bob Marley, uh, Do Donna Summer, my mum loved disco. It was very few people, so I didn't really know much, you know, I didn't know much music until I came to Australia and it was like somebody opened up this can and just went, look at this world of music. So I kind of spent the first few years um, in Australia just just actually listening and learning music because, you know, like I'd never heard, 80, you know, like particularly 80s music. Um, there's a lot of things I didn't know. So I literally spent my time um, just learning um, music and just listening. And then when I was about, uh, I think, uh, 16 or so, um, there was a guy, his name uh, was, or his name is Kibwe. Kibwe was, uh, he was, if I remember correctly, Kibwe was the first uh, African to be signed um, by Sony Music in France. And he uh, would do spoken word kind of rap type of music. Um, and he had this song that I didn't know. My mum told me later on. He had a song called Casamance. 
um, and Casamans was about, um, it was where, so he was West, he was West African. And Casamans is where they, is it, uh, the, the town that they got all the slaves from, or a majority of the slaves from. And so it's a song that is um, known all over Africa. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, so that's how he came to his fame. He came to Australia for a tour. My mum had a shop. Um, in South Yarra, just off Chapel Street, um, Commercial Road, and Kibwe came in with his manager and I think they started talking and he said, I'm looking for a backing singer because I don't know anybody here and I'm staying here for a few months. And mum said, as any good mum does, my daughter can sing. And I was called down because we lived upstairs. So she's like, Joyce! So I come down and she's like, look, he needs a singer. You can sing. And that's, that was me. And I was like, um, okay, I, I can sing. Sure. So suddenly I, I came from singing in my bedroom and whatever to going and singing with this guy who had quite a following, which was quite interesting. So I sang with him for a while. Um, and I remember I was doing year 11 or year 12 whilst I was um, singing for him. So I would go, I'd go to school, um, finish school, come home, do a little bit of homework and then mum would drive me to rehearsal and then pick me up and I'd come home about 11 and maybe finish my homework or go to sleep. Fridays or Saturdays, when the, usually Fridays would have gigs, so same thing, I'd go finish school, go home, and then um, go and sing, you know, in front of people like at the Palais. And I didn't know these places. I was just, it, it could have been the milk bar to me. It was just like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had no idea. Um, so I sang with him for a while. Um, and then I think he moved. He moved from memory. He moved um, interstate and my mum was not letting me go. She was like, mm, no, I was still 17. I finished high school in, um, when I was 17. Mm -hmm. So mum was like, she would have had to sign for me to go. Mm -hmm. She was like, you're crazy. You're not going. You're staying here. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's how I got into music, really. Wow. I, I didn't realise he was living in Australia. I thought he was touring and uh, then he was off. I mean, especially if he was signed to Sony in France, I thought he'd be doing a lot of European work. So he, um, yeah, so I, I don't know. He came here and he toured, he toured a lot in Australia, mm. you know. He toured a lot. In, we did a lot of shows. What year was that, Joyce? What, what year was that? It was in the 90s. Okay. I want to say... So if I finished school in maybe 94, I want to say before 95, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. Is he, Sorry? is he from Kenya as, as well? Or? No, no, I feel he was from Zaire. I just know he was French speaking. Okay. I remember that. He was French speaking. Um, um, and I think one of the reasons why he probably got me in his band was because I am bilingual, so I could sing in English and I could sing in Swahili, um, so you know what I mean? And if I had to, I could sing in French. So that's how I think it was just a really good match mm. between us. Yeah. But um, in Kenya, aren't they an English? Yeah. They're an English country, right? They've got, they yeah. were colonised so we by were the English. Yeah, so we were colonised by the British. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, colonised by the British um, and we got our independence um, in in the 70s, I think. And, uh, but, yeah, it's an English-speaking country. So um, at school, all school learns English, but we also have our national language, which is Swahili. Oh, right. So that's... So you, it, learn, you learn both English and Swahili at school. So Swahili is a South African language, isn't it? No, no, it's a Bantu. Right. So, yeah, so it's tribal. We're, we're not, Africa is not so much in countries, it's in tribes. Yeah. You have the Bantus, the Ashantis, mm -hmm. the nomads. So it, it, it's a, um, so like the Dinkas, who are the really tall yeah. Sudanese yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. they're a different tribe. Yeah. There's, there's a language that they, 
they speak, that is a mm. dialect that is, you know, um, widely spoken. And then, um, then, like we have Swahili is the is the dialect we all speak, but we also have our mother tongue, which is our tribe. Mm. So I'm from the Kikuyu tribe. So we have a totally different, um, you know, language as well. But Swahili is probably Swahili and French are probably the most commonly spoken. Um, uh, languages in Africa. Yeah. I went to Ethiopia in uh, 2005. Oh, did you? Yeah. How yeah. was that? I've never been to Ethiopia. <laughs> what is that? That was a trip, I can tell you. Um, I remember sitting in a theatre show, to be honest with you. There was about a 1,000 Ethiopians in this theatre show and I sat dead smack in the middle in the stalls <laughs> and I looked around and I've gone, you know, I'm the whitest person here, man. <laughs> And I've never experienced that. That was so intense for me. And then I just relaxed and it was cool. It was just like, you know, I don't worry about it. You know what I mean? It was, but initially yeah. I, when I just thought about it, I, I looked everywhere. I'm going, and I'm not a light skinned person either. I'm sort of chocolate. But you were like, I'm the whitest. <laughs> and I'm the white, and I was, I was like cream. I was like, uh, you know, those milky bar uh, chocolates, you know. Yes, yes. And uh, that sort of was interesting for me, you know, just to sort of observe that because I was the mon- minority uh, whereas yeah. Africans in Australia were the minority, you know. Yeah, it's a really, it, it is a, a really, in, it's an intense, like you said, it's a really intense feeling. Like I say this a lot to people. Um, I didn't know I was black until I came to Australia. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? I didn't know. I was just me. I was a Kikuyu girl from Kenya. And I lived in Nairobi. That's what I was. And then to come to Australia and have that moment that you had of looking up and going, oh, my God, I am the only black person in as far as the eye can see. And it was back when if you saw a black person walking down the street on the other side of the street, I kid you not, you would cross the road and go and say hello. It was like coming to America. You know that scene when they meet the prince at the at the at the baseball game? Mm. You know, it was like that. Mm. And it, if you saw, and it didn't matter, you know, whilst Africans are very tribal, when we came here, it, that kind of went. Mm. And you, you, you're just African, mm. you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, so I remember that that feeling. I know it well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that that was, yeah, but Ethiopia have their own language, obviously. They've got the Amharic uh, language and um, yeah. very, very uh, talented people. Um, I was living in just outside of Addis Ababa and I stayed there for about, two months something like that and I met desert people I met all sorts of uh tribal people it was quite right. really interesting yeah and I the, hope one day to go to Ethiopia and yeah. I got and I remember getting really sick coming back off on the plane I got food poisoning on Air Ethiopia and I was so oh, I was God. I was so sick man <laughs> Sorry to laugh, no, no. but I've been where you were. I've been there when you're traveling. There's nothing like it. Yeah, no, there's nothing like it. And uh, I was hospitalized for about two days because, um, you know, wow. yeah, they, they, what did you eat? Was I said, it the air or no, something you ate? It was, it was a sandwich I had it eaten on the plane. You know how they come around with sandwiches? I just had a sandwich and. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and it fucked me up. I mean, I remember just. The, it was like I was when I would burp, it would have this metallic taste in it. It was just disgusting, you know. And um, oh my god! So I, I stumbled out of the airport and went straight to Royal Melbourne Hospital, and uh, I, I was so sick, and they had to inject me with morphine the whole bit, you know, uh, put me on a drip. Holy yeah. crap! It was pretty full. On. <laughs> it was thanks to the European Airlines. <laughs> yeah, they it messed me up, but. Um, you know that's how it goes, but that was a that was an that was an incredible trip for me. But I've also been as a young child. I went to South Africa. Um, we used to we were staying. We lived on a an Italian cruise ship and it docked at uh, Durban back in the early seventies. Right. And this is when they had apartheid, and mm. I, I remember. Wow. I just remember I was very young, and I remember mm. my my father was told that because he and I had dark complexion and my mother and sister had light complexion 
that we couldn't walk together. They had to go on the white side and my father and I had to go on the coloured side of the road. And my father goes, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a European. <laughs> 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 and, uh, <laughs> and so, wow. I, yeah, and I remember going up, up on the deck, back on the deck, and I saw these African men working on the railway line. That would have been about 200 metres away from the, from the dock, working on the railway line. And I could see it visibly. And I remember just looking at this guy and I waved to him. And my father goes, no, don't wave. We'll get into trouble, you know. And I kept waving at him. And I remember he put his shovel down and he looked at me and he waved back at me. And then I just said, sir, there's no problem, Dad. And then I, I went up and we went together and back onto the boat. So th- those were the two things I remember of stopping in South Africa as a child. But as you can imagine, it was during the height of the apartheid, which was pretty uh, full on. Like I had no concept of it. Isn't That's it? Not. Yeah, I, I remember. So I've still got my first passport, which was probably cut early 80s, right? And... Um, and many years later, I, I don't know why I looked, but on the back of the passport, it actually says, not 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 allowed, not welcome in the Republic of South Africa. Mm. And I remember thinking, hang on a second, but is there South Africa in Africa? Yeah. How can I, an African, not be welcome in my own continent? Yeah. Like, you know, and then, you know, and then obviously, because um, it, you know... It's very different when you're over there. I think it's it's very different. The memory of a child about these things, like you're saying, is very different. Like I don't, um, like I said, I was, I didn't, I, I was black when I came here. To mm. me, none of that ever mattered. Mm. There was always a, 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 a particular. We didn't live around white people, mm. so it was never. It was just never a thing. Mm. You know what I mean? It yeah. just was never a thing. So. Um, I found that to be really, I found that to be really fascinating Mm. that, wow, okay, so I couldn't have gone to South Africa if I'd wanted to. Mm. And what type of shop did your mum have in Turak? Mum's shop was an African shop. It was called Anne's African Bazaar. So when my mum came to Australia in earlier 80s, um, she came with like bags these African bags to sell. She was coming for a month to see what it was like. And um, she, you know, sold her bags. And eventually we ended up having a shop. We had, you know, we moved our shop around and it was an African, an African business. So we would buy, uh, we would import um, bags, a lot of wood. It was back when you could import pretty much anything you wanted. Mm. So wood, um, mum, like in my house, I have a seven foot giraffe. So we used to import these seven foot giraffe. I know, right? Okay. I love a giraffe. Don't even start. Okay. So <laughs> it's my feature piece. And um, so, yes, yeah, so we used to import, um, you know, African wares and mm. she used to sell um, retail in our shop and wholesale. So we had... Like sports girl used to buy our bags. Um, Ishka was a massive yeah. customer of ours. Um, so yeah, so she did this for a really, really long time, um, and then she she probably stopped the business early two thousands. Um, she stopped it um, or the retail store anyway um, to become a social worker. Okay. It was when the um, it was when Australia started in taking a lot of refugees from Africa. Mm-hmm. And so because in our shop, mum was quite a, um, a figure within our community because, as I said, once we left Africa, we were all just Africans. We went from Sudan, South Sudan. We went, we were just all Africans. So a lot of times we had people coming through our house a lot. You know, it was just people would knock on the door and go, hey, you know, Mama Anna, I got your phone number. Somebody told me to come and find you. So, mum, we were always putting people up in my house. So when, I guess, um, the a lot of the refugees started coming into Australia, Ethiopians and South Sudanese and so on, mum, and Somalians, mum, uh, because being bilingual, she decided she can help in that way. So she closed up the shop to to work within the community. So where do you live currently? Where are your where are you stationed? 
So I'm on the bay side. I'm in Brighton with Karen. We've done all of Brighton. God damn it. So I'm in <laughs> So I'm in Brighton. Mum's just in Elstonwick. So yeah, you know, it's uh my daughter, it's it's close to where I've I've like I've always lived in the in um the southeastern South. suburbs mm. since we came to, to Australia. So we just stay here. You know, I never to to be honest with you, I lived in St Kilda for about nine years um, in my 20s mm. and um, well it was in Alwood really Balaclava and it was right near right. Carlisle Street and um, I, I was around that area from about 95 to about 2000 and I saw the change around that area and I, in the mid 90s I thought it was fantastic it really mm. had an old culture it was um, you know I, was, I remember seeing the old Jewish guy who owned the his old shop that no one used to go into and I brought a microphone stand from him and, you know, <laughs> yep. all that sort of stuff. And uh, there was no shops open on a Sunday. The, the the Russian bakery was the only thing open on a Sunday and I really liked that. And then everything changed, you know, the hole in the wall came and then once that came, every hour, shops were selling up and everything, you know, the pinball yeah. parlour shop closed down, the fish and chip shop closed down and that was it. It was just all over then. It was all designer clothes and cafes and everything else that went in there and then the, the whole uh, community feel had it just seemed like people were moving out because they were forced out because they couldn't afford to stay there yeah. yes absolutely it became yeah I did find it curious that um, we are like I remember as a teenager my mum would be like you cannot go to St Kilda okay stay away from St Kilda so of course as soon as I can the only thing I wanted to do was go to St Kilda like <laughs> you know <laughs> and it was just that there was just this this you know there was this energy about it you know and that's why you went there mm. for that energy mm. of it was arty it was creative it was a little crazy it was you know what I mean and and for me to be honest with you there was a lot of Aboriginal people yeah. like Indigenous people who I was like I'd never seen them yeah so for me I was like I, I quite liked it yeah. you know what I mean um and then and, uh, yeah, and I do remember when it all started changing and I just thought, but you're moving here because of that energy, but you don't want that energy once you move here. You you can't do that, yeah. you know, then you should stay in Turak. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. stay in Turak yeah. um, because then it's just boring there and leave the life of St Kilda the way it is, yeah, no, you know. It's, so I, yeah, like now it's it's, it's a, all over. I don't even know what's going on. Yeah, no, it's all, it's all <laughs> over. <don't> no, no. <laughs> have you ever sung in a choir before? Yeah, you have. Yeah, um, totally. My cousins and I um, in Kenya, we had a, 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 a. As I said, there's a lot of us, <laughs> so we can have a big choir, and so it was in the. Uh, early, no, late 80s, I think. Uh, yeah, like mid 80s, I say. And I remember we had this choir and it was me and my like seven cousins or something. And so, and I was in the school choir as well. So, you know, I, yeah, but I just remember the one with my cousins was, was my favourite choir to be involved in. Okay. And was that traditional music that you'd be playing or was it contemporary? No, it was gospel. Gospel music, it was okay. Gospel music, yeah. yeah. Yeah, gospel music. So I grew up with harmonies mm. and turnarounds mm. and you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. and over singing like you cannot believe yeah. <laughs> and just, you know what I mean? That's what I come from. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of a cappella, um, you know, a lot of a cappella stuff. So that's my background. Mm -hmm. So I, my ear is, I'd say, a million times more developed than my, the, you know, theoretical knowledge. Yeah. My ear is the most developed thing yeah. that I have, yeah. Sure. So you can pick the note and all that sort of stuff and you can. Yeah, you know. And you go. So and you, and, but you, yeah, so it's um, like I don't read music. Yeah. But I don't know. It was weird because. I mean, because remember, I came here, you know, when I came as a 10-year-old, 
you know, it was the 80s, late 80s, really, you know, like to even find a singing teacher. My mum was a, you know, a African migrant woman. She's like, what the hell are you talking about? Singing? Trying to even find a singing teacher. What, you've got to be taught how to sing? Singing is natural. So that's where, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I had to be really self-taught about everything that I did okay. had to be self-taught. Yeah. Where mum could, she would get me, you know, she would sometimes she would find singing teachers just accidentally and she'd be like, I found a singing teacher, you're going to that teacher. And then I'd go and I'd be like, they're not a singing teacher. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're a bass player. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, <laughs> He's a bass player. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious, you know. Yeah. So I was really self-taught, yeah. really, really self-taught. So I've relied on my ear, mm. I'd say, 90% of the time. Yeah, no, that's great skill to have. Uh, I did a little bit of vocal training in the early 90s. I went to the Malba School of Singing and I had this... Uh, <laughs> I had this gay guy uh, who who ran the school and he used to smoke a lot of cigarettes and he used to have a massive ashtray and it was chock-a-block full of cigarettes, right? He wouldn't I sm- love it. He wouldn't smoke when I was um, singing, doing my uh, practice with him. But to be honest with you, after 12 months of going there once a week and practicing, you know, five days a week at home, mm-hmm. um, by the end of 1991, I could hear us, I could get a sheet of music and read the music and sing in key and follow the chart and oh wow like I, I could do all of that stuff and then I, he got to a point where he said I'm going to put my head on the chopping block <laughs> I'm going to recommend you to a <laughs> to a theatre group and I said look man <laughs> I said don't worry about a theatre group I want to sing rock and roll you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know I just anyway but I I just I, went, I don't know why I stopped. It was sort of weird because I really enjoyed it and it was all about breathing and uh, practising and, and I yeah. think anyone can sing. I think it's just a matter of breathing, practising, um, yeah, and just if you can get a if you, and you, it, you, you can, if you can learn how to play a little bit of piano and you can accompany yourself with the piano, it will help you immensely, I think, you know. Absolutely. Well, my daughter, interestingly enough, so Kaziah is, um, you know, obviously, you know, quite musical. And so with the pandemic, you know, since we got locked down, um, because obviously we've got instruments in the house. So when we got locked down, she just was like, okay, because I was working. So sometimes we couldn't talk for much. So she would finish school, set up her keyboard or whatever it was, and she would just start playing. And the whole, like you're saying, accompanying herself playing has developed her musical talent, her E, her understanding of music Mm. like tenfold. Mm. It's been incredible. Once she worked out how to accompany herself on the keyboard, then she picked up the guitar and she's done that. And it's been, that's been the greatest. It's not the singing lessons she's had. It's not the competitions she's done. It's not the any. It's not any of that. Mm. It's the being able to accompany herself, and it's really built her confidence yeah. as well. Absolutely, yeah, it's great. No, it does. It builds your confidence. You you, you um, can pick up a bit. Of, well, I found I could sing Jackson Brown songs, and uh, mm. I could get with a bass player, and uh, and I'd play a little bit of acoustic guitar and sing along and uh, we miss out the, the you know like we'll miss out on a on a chorus and we'll go straight to a verse or something and uh, you know because I <laughs> you just don't stop right you just do whatever you need to do but no I, I, I yeah. it's really great fun I, I really you know in reminiscing I can uh, just see how much fun it was you've worked with some interesting people what what uh, dastardly deeds did you encounter with Jesse J <laughs> So, okay, so TV is a wonderful thing, you know. TV, I find just, I find TV so curious. I, I, I'm, I can't say I'm a big fan yeah. of TV work, but I find it really curious because it literally is not about what you can do or anything. Mm. It's literally just about what you look like. Mm. That's it. Yeah. And I find that I don't like that feeling mm. where I am literally just judged by that. Yeah. So we got a job, we got called and told, 
we've got a great job, uh, job, great gig for you with Jesse J doing the Logies. Okay, now that's a pretty big deal. Mm. So we were very excited. We went and we went to our rehearsal. It, it was great. Yeah. And then on the day, we went set up on stage. And when we went to sing, they'd bloody recorded vocals before. You're right. And we didn't even get to sing. So you were over. So we were just meant to stand there and just look pretty, I, look pretty, I've, look pretty. You were overdubbing. You were just yeah. Yeah, sinking, yeah. It was so, and I remember going, why were we even here? Yeah. Like literally, why were we even here? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, what do you do? You've signed a contract. That's right. Um, so I think, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't know why that would have been. Um, yeah, I don't know why that would have been, but, you know, she she sung live yeah. and she was <clears throat> absolutely incredible this her voice, mm. you know, just, it's great. Um, but I just, I found it really curious that a singer would ask other singers to come on her or his stage and have them dubbed over. Because mm. if you come on my stage, I will always let, I've called you for what you can do. Mm. You know what I mean? I've yeah. called you for what you can do yeah. and I will respect you enough. Yeah. To let you do that, sure. you know, like that's how I run my bands. Yeah. When they're like, "Oh, what should we do?" I go, mm, 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 mm. "I'm a singer. I do the singing bit. Okay, <laughs> you do the other bit. Yeah. That's what you're here for. That's why I pay you for, <laughs> right? If otherwise, I'll do it myself. <laughs> you know, badly. <laughs> you know, so it was just a very curious. I found my TV experiences all. A majority of them very curious. Um, Australia's Got Talent was the same mm. kind of situation. Yeah. The call that we got, I mean, now you follow some of the things that I say on my Facebook, so you know how yeah. I feel about um, certain things, uh, I'm yes, sure. Yes, I do. So we got a call, <laughs> we got a call <laughs> and the call said, um, <clears throat> so we have this comedian and he's doing it a bit and he needs three black singers. Yeah. So ultimately we were hired because we were black. Okay. Um, we could sing. So when we went, we, we organ, you know, we created something and we sung it. But the call wasn't, can you please come and do some gospel singing? The call was, we need three black singers. I got the call. And I knew two other black girls. They're the only other two black singers I knew. So I was like, I only know two others. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's how we, that's actually how we, we got onto the show. Yeah. After that, we got to sing. But that's, that's what got us on the show, which I do find curious, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it was never, it, it didn't start off being, we'd love to have you come and work on the show. It was just, you look the part, come on then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, it's one of those things where you go, how can it be that this this skin of mine can be my best asset mm. and it can also be my worst asset? Yeah. I just found that, I found that really weird, mm. you know? I found that really weird, but my mum was always really good. She was always like, you know what you're going to do? You're going to use your skin however you need to use it. Yeah. Don't let it be the thing that holds you back from doing things. Let it be the thing that puts you forward for things. So choose things that um that you will complement yeah. rather than things that you're going to have to fight and fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. Mm. Choose something that you will complement and that will complement you, yeah. you know, because she was very clear about what kind of country Australia is when we first came here. So that's that's what I found just, yeah, just a bit odd about the whole television thing. Like I did it and I was like, hey, I, if it's my skin that gets me there, I'll do it. Yeah. So, I can you know, my little bucket list, I've done it. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, that's why we're here, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> give, it a, give it a tick. <laughs> So, yeah, interesting. It is. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Joyce. It's been great chatting with you. 
Thank you. I hope I didn't talk your ear off. No, not at all. It's been wonderful. Awesome. It's good to well, see you. Thanks so much for having me. It's been so nice. Hopefully things will open up before the end of the year and we'll be able to do shows again. Take care of yourself. I'll chat to you soon. Okay. okay. <laughs> You must have cast a spell.